Nearman Condition, the home of Collected oh, Edition. That cover is so awesome. Absolute format is the best way to own this store. Time to empty those wallets and fill those shelves. How's it going, all you mentees? Uncanny Omar here from Nearman Condition, the home of Collected Editions. And join me today for an overview of all of these trades that have come out recently from Dark Horse Comics. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, before going any further, I want to thank the folks at Dark Horse for sending us copies of these books. And this is what I've been doing for the last couple of weeks. I have been reading a lot of Dark Horse trade paperbacks, and all of these should be out now in the direct market and the book market. So we got a lot to talk about. As always, in the t description of the video, I leave the timestamps to let you know when I'm going to start talking about a certain book in case you don't want any kind of spoilers. You're just doing it blind by based on the creators or in case you're more interested in a particular book but before i go any further smash that like button please that goes a long way for us here on the channel and it's a very small thing you can do all right today we're gonna be kicking it off with memoria right there or memoria however you want to say it so let's just go ahead and dive in because we got a lot to talk about Okay, so here we have Memoria. This is written by Kurt Pyers, and it is drawn by Sunando C. You have colors by Mark Dell. And then Hassan Otsamane Elahau is the letter. This was an original comicsology, and I'm just going to go ahead and say that this is for mature audiences. Uh, there's a lot of graphic violence in this one. Uh, in the back, this is described as a lethal weapon. Here, let's go back to the beginning so I can explain what's going on. Lethal weapon meets, uh, what was it, uh, Seven, I believe is what they referred it to. Uh, no, True Detective, sorry, which I also enjoyed. Uh, but no, this doesn't really feel like Lethal Weapon. Lethal Weapon had a really interesting, funny chemistry between the two uh, protagonists. And, you know, it had that Richard Donner flair to it. This feels definitely like True Detective and some Seven um, because there's really not a lot of lightheartedness to this. So we start off with an interview right here of Robert Shepard, who is the acting chief of police. And he's recalling back to a specific case that happened a while back. And slowly he is introducing us through a series of flashbacks to our two leads. And that is Detective Reynolds and Detective Daniels. Detective Reynolds is older. He's about to retire and also suffering from cancer, battling cancer. Whereas Detective Daniels is new and still gung-ho or a young detective attitude about solving cases. So in this particular book, that collects all five issues of this comicsology series, um, we see them investigate this series of crimes that have been going on. So it's a series of murders, and it could be the most prolific serial killer in American history that no one has heard of. And the twists and turns that this takes in, in directions that it went, I didn't really see coming. And, I, and I'm a big fan of uh, movies and TV shows like True Detective or David Fincher films. Uh, and, you know, big fan of crime noir. But there were a lot of things that happened through this particular series that I didn't see coming. And yeah, I, I'm still shocked by the way that this ended. Because when you read enough stories like this, you kind of get that formula going. You kind of figure out, okay, this is how it's going to happen. This is who's going to solve the case. Uh, but it does not go in ways that I thought it was going to go. Now, all the way in the back, we have some issue covers back here. And then the end. The book has 152 pages and retails for $22.99. Even though this is a trade paperback, it does have sewn binding. So it makes those spread pages so much more visible to see. Lost Boy. This one was a really quick read, and I think it had a lot to do with the premise of it. I really enjoyed. Uh, this is by Jay Martin, who does the script, the art, and also the covers. And then Frank Shetkovic is the letterer here. There's an introduction by Sean Mendes talking about pretty much how Jay Martin should have always done a graphic novel because he's such an amazing storyboard artist. And it is 
amazing. I really enjoyed this one. The pick of this particular bunch was so hard um, because there's so many good stories in here and a freaking reprint of a classic. All right. So what Lost Boy is, is we meet this character of Jack. He's with his dad on a trip. They're heading to Wyoming to go and ski. He's not a fan of skiing. It's just something that his father wants him to do. And they kind of get into a little bit of a argument. His father dodges a deer on the road, but ends up hitting the deer and also running off the road to a big ditch on the side of the mountain. So Jack flies out of the car through the windshield and notices that the deer is dead, but also that his father did not survive this particular fall. And now he is left here on his own and he's having images of things, hallucinations of perhaps just, uh, you know, survival instinct kicking in. And that's what he does. He sets out to survive and he ends up finding the baby deer. And uh, as you find out that it was his mother that was hit by the car. And it's funny because his interaction is him talking to the deer. So you do get lots of dialogue and he's pretty much like okay i guess that makes us even my dad's dead and so is your mom so now we have to try to live together and that's what they do they try to survive out in the wilderness against not just wolves but just the ice cold and the limited amount of food that he has so this one was a lot of fun i really like this story i'm a big fan of the book hatchet i don't know if anybody had to read that when you were growing up there's just a little bit of extras in the back like uh, this is the uncolored stuff and then a couple of character sketches like the fawn right here and then Jack. But yes, it's about a young boy lost in the wilderness. I can actually see this working as a movie too. 128 pages in the book retails for $19.99. The Ones. This was such a cool pitch. So this is by Brian Michael Bendis. And it is drawn by Jacob Edgar. Jacob Edgar, uh, he's the one that drew some Batman issues. And of course, Brian Michael Bendis coming from Jinx World, bringing all the Jinx World over to Dark Horse Comics. But Ultimate Spider-Man, New Avengers, X-Men, Uncanny X-Men. Uh, he wrote also Superman. So a lot of people are familiar with him. But his biggest independent work that he did was probably Powers. Now, this is not set in the world of Powers. It's just its own standalone thing. Uh, but... What this is, is through history, there's always been a single person that has been regarded as the one. And I'm sure most people are familiar with that idea, right? Uh, whether it's the Matrix or whether it's Avatar. I don't know why I went with Avatar to last star. Uh, Airbender, not Avatar, the, uh, the, <laughs> the blue people. But in this particular story... A group of people meets, and they've all been chosen to be the one, whether it's the one demon slayer or the one um, person that's going to carry on the magic. But all of these people meet, and what happens is during one of these meetings of the ones, the, the, the first meeting actually, they find out that there is going to be the one. There is definitely going to be one that has just been born, and it is the spawn of Satan. And they all have to go and uh, get rid of the one. So all these people that have been picked out to be the one, whatever they may be, uh, have a specialty in, have gathered together to talk about what they're going to do. So they're like, look, it's a baby. We'll just ride it out. We'll see what happens. <laughs> so then you get six years later where hell has just broken out. And... That's kind of the premise of this. That's that. Uh, that's a little bit of the pitch. So these group of people, a uh, swordsman, a magician, a character that's kind of like Superman, an alien character, have to team up to take down the one. And you get a series of flashbacks as to why they decided not to do it. And maybe they should have done it when the, the, the spawn was only two years old. But now this, uh, this, the, the one is six years old. Um, but here you meet your cast of characters like Thrace, uh, Wilson, and Novus, Chester, and Dorothy, and Barb here. So that's your main cast of characters. And they, they tell you exactly what their specialty is. And there's the Mystic Master here, Dr. J. Max. But the whole story is about them coming to terms with the mistake that they made. They should have killed this character. 
kid as the baby and then they're like no i don't regret it but yeah it's funny it doesn't take itself seriously it's uh as a matter of fact in the back it's described as ghostbusters meets good omens yeah i can see that but it has that a little bit of the goonies just because these group of friends have become a family now yeah and this is a volume one it does continue in between the chapters you get the origin story of some of the characters like this one's for novice and they're done in black and white all the way in the back you get original artwork here and then character designs the book has 152 pages and retails for 24 dollars and 99 cents and that is the ones next up is cold iron and this is another one that was a comicsology original and this is written by Andy Diggle. It's drawn by Nick Brokenshire and colored by Triona Farrell. Simon Bolin is the lettering. And then the design is Tom Mueller. Just a big fan of Tom Mueller and his designs on the Krakoa era of X-Men trade paperbacks and hardcovers. All right. So what this book is about is on the Isle of Man, a singer known as Kay um, has always wanted to escape this island. But before we meet her, and as she's uh, entertaining a group of kids, we meet a horde of demons. And their leader is like, bring her back to me. Now, at first you think they're talking about Kay. Um, as she's singing about demons and teaching these kids about the Isle of Man's Halloween, which is called Hoptuna. But as you find out, she just wants to escape. She wants her songs to take her place. She lives with her grandmother, who has a lot of faith in her. And also believes in a little bit of the superstitions about demons. So as she's driving out, and by the way, this is all for luck. You get to find out what the horseshoe is, uh, uh, is used for. And of course, where cold iron comes from, the idea of cold iron. But as she is driving out one day, she runs upon this girl who is being chased by the horde of demons. And now it's up to her to help her out. Uh, this young lady that she doesn't even know. And she takes it upon herself to do that because she's just that type of person. And, of course, her grandma uh, steps in and helps out and she becomes a complete badass. This collects the first four issues and it goes places that I didn't expect it to go. And the ending, I thought the ending was done really well. So it is an all-in-one. There is no volume two or anything after this. Maybe they'll revisit it one day. But as you find out, Cold Iron is what is supposed to be used against demons. Or, or so say the folklore. And her decision at the end I thought was so well done. Just because of the type of character that she's been building up to be. But this book has 152 pages and retails for $19.99. The artwork is easy to follow. Good sequential flow. Let me check out the extras, which is the concept design. There is an epilogue, but I didn't get a chance to read it. And the epilogue is all done in a prose format. So it's like a book. There are no pictures. It's about 10 to 12 pages. I haven't had a chance to read it. I just read the main story. Um, you have character designs on the demons, the main characters right here. Actually, the character, it's really cool to see the early designs of Kay, how she started off, and then what she ended up becoming. But they did the same thing, the characters of the fairies and the demons in the forest, and how they kind of took shape and form. And even Mona, the girl that's being wanted by the demons, started off as a blonde girl. kind of reminds me a little bit of Terry Moore's artwork. And then the biography on the team on the back and that is cold iron hellstone by the raphaels i'll explain what i mean here in a minute this is another one that is a comicsology original and this one also mature content but so was cold iron uh just because of the um, violence this could work as a movie but like honestly a lot of the books that uh, Comicsology and Dark Horse have been putting out could work as a movie or a miniseries. So, written by Rafael Scavone and Rafael de la Torre doing the artwork. Color is his Wesley Manuel, and then lettering is done by Bernardo Bryce. So, that's what I meant by the Rafaels. Now, this takes place in Montana in a small town called Hellstone, hence the title. And this is set a long time ago, and you'll get 
when, as I explain what's going on and what's taking place. So we meet this young girl named Mary who disappears. Her mother goes to the town sheriff. And this is where you find Sheriff Denton Ross. And you find out that the town is nearby a military factory where he goes and, you know, he talks to these people, but they don't know exactly. Like, the town folk have no idea what this factory is creating, why it's there. Now, he's in friendly terms, well, sort of. He's in speaking terms with the military. And this is a union factory right here. And any questions that he brings up, you know, they take offense right here. So this is the captain. He's talking to him. He's like, look, we've had some missing people. And he's like, what are you trying to say? Are you accusing the Union Army of anything? Just go on and say it. And of course, he can't come out and say it. But everybody knows that the disappearances of all these people, including his own son, has something to do with this factory that ha just kind of popped up out of nowhere. And he has a deputy named Tobias. And both of them go and explore more and more as to the disappearances of all these people. And there is something strange that is out in the woods that could be tied to Native American lore. Or it could be tied to maybe the factory and some scientific experiments. Uh, I love the relationship between him and his wife. You know, they both lost their son. Percy's out there and they never found his body. So they don't know if he's alive. And what he finds in here, it, let's just say it gets kind of crazy. It didn't go the way that I thought it was going to go. This one was freaking awesome. And like I said, like this is so hard to pick just one book from these batches. All the way in the back, we have a cover gallery. This is another one that has sewn binding. 134 pages and retails for $22.99. A little bit about the creators right here. And that is Hellstone. Air, Volume 3. So I have been reading these. I had never read the original ones that came out from Vertigo Comics. So these were originally published by Vertigo Comic. And this Volume 3 is not the ending. I remember, I think when I was doing an overview of Volume 2, somebody said that Volume 3 would wrap it up. No. I assume there's going to be more. Now, here's a little bit about the story so far, about Blythe and how she got tied into this world. So if you haven't read Volumes 1 and 2, this I don't recommend as a good jumping on point. Uh, because it's just, you're already looped into this world. You you know, like her powers have been activated. People have shown up in here that should not be alive. So in case you haven't read Volumes 1 and 2, uh, yeah, I suggest you do that, or if you don't care about spoilers, let's just continue with uh, this particular overview. The artwork, again, is by M. Key Perker. As a matter of fact, let's give credit where credit is due, because the color is by Chris Chucky, and then lettering by Jared K. Fletcher. Of course, written by G. Willow Wilson. So, we are back with Blythe. This time, she has learned to control, or she's learning to control her powers. That could tap into time travel. Uh, we've see her connect with Amelia Earhart, who she met in the previous volume. And it's weird to see where all this started, because this all started with her chasing this, who she thought was the love of her life, uh, Zane. But when Zane disappeared, she found out that he came from this country that's not supposed to exist, and she goes on a mission to try to find him, where it takes her into weird places. And the places it goes here, uh, this guy right here, Gian, Gian? Uh, anyway, the places this goes, I didn't expect it to go because now we have the Jihad involved. It's a group of metalhead Jihadists and they have their own backstory and how it's tied into Zane and how Blythe gets involved. And it just goes places that I didn't expect it to go. So when I thought this was wrapping up, because like I said, I think it was a couple of my viewers told me this would be the last one. I was like, what? There's way too much because the ending leaves you with a big cliffhanger. And as it turns out, I think there's one more volume. And M.K. Perker, I remember M.K. Perker's art in Fables. And then, of course, recently in the Unwritten. Um, but it's just evolved. I really like their artwork in here. Now, all the way in the back is an ad for Invisible Kingdom. If you've not read it, that is freaking phenomenal by G. Willow Wilson and Christian Ward. Uh, but you get a biography on both of the creators. And then, see, volumes one, two, three, and four. A history of the future. So we have another one coming. And this is all part of the Burger Books. And now it's come to be that time of the video where we check out all of the spines of these books that have been recently released by Dark Horse Comics. And also a reminder to smash that like button, subscribe, and ring that bell for notifications. 
All right, let's continue with the overviews because we still got a lot to talk about. Here we have Night of the Ghoul. This is another one that was originally published as a comicsology, and now it's coming out in a trade paperback by Scott Snyder and Francisco Francavilla. And please correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think the two have worked together before. Lettering by N World Design, and because Francisco Francavilla has done stuff at Marvel Comics, done stuff at DC, he's done independent stuff, and of course Scott Snyder, DC and independent stuff, but I don't think the two have worked together. This is a really cool story. Uh, it reminds me of the uh, Masters of Horror episode, but I'll explain uh, in case you haven't seen Masters of Horror. So we meet a, uh, two characters at the very beginning. It's a father and son. This is Forrest Inman and Orson. Kind of drags his son to go through these things. This is so weird. Why would you drag your son to this hospital? So what... The character of Forrest Inman is doing is he's trying to recover this lost film. In the past, in I think it was in 1936, uh, there was a filmmaker named T.F. Merritt who spent decades in this retirement home, and that's why they're here. He was making a film, and the film is the title of the book, The Night of the Ghoul. However, something horrible happened in the making of it where the entire cast, the film footage got destroyed, but through years of research, this gentleman right here, Forrest Inman, was able to track down most of the footage. There's still some missing, and he was able to track down the director, this filmmaker. This is T.F. Merritt, but he's going by another name, and he's surprised. He's like, how do you know my real name? He's like, look, I got something to show you. Night of the Ghoul. And the way that this comic is done is it's done in a series of, you know, present day story where you have the father and son going to this retirement home center. He's given 20 minutes to talk to this old guy. And he lied. He lied to the people working there. He lied to the doctor telling them that, oh, yeah, I'm the insurance agent. I just need to talk to him about his money. Um, and then we get film footage of Night of the Ghoul. And what the story is about, set in 1916 during this particular World War One, And they go to Castle Kula here, where there could be a ghoul that exists and is going around killing people. There's some freaky imagery. This would be an awesome read if you're looking for something for October, which is right around the corner. It'll be here before you know it. Uh, but this also has a lot of twists and turns that I didn't expect. It was a good, quick read. It had me... I mean, you... It sucked me in. I've really enjoyed this one. Uh, Francesco Francavilla's artwork is just phenomenal. The colors are great. And the twists and turns where it goes, when you find out exactly about the ghoul and if it's real, if the movie's real, what it all means, and who are these people? Are they even doctors? Is this really a retirement center? Uh, this one here is it's not... Yeah, I'd say it has a mature rating on it, but because of the graphic violence, and that's about it. Uh, but one hell of a read. No pun intended. All the way in the back is where you're going to find the covers. So the chapter breaks are just done by like chapter one, chapter two. The pitch, the designs. I love the posters here of, uh, of the ghoul. And original artwork right there of sketches, the thumbnail sketches, and a little bit of what else is available from Comixology Originals. This book has 155 pages and retails for $19.99. Prism Stalker, The Weeping Star by Sloane Leong. I will say this was one of the most confusing reads I had um, because I wasn't aware that there was a volume one. So this is a volume two. Uh, if the pitch captivates you and... The art just lures you in, and I really enjoy the artwork in here. I'm so glad that they did this right here, though, so you can catch up on the characters. Our story so far. I just thought they were being artsy, and I thought, oh, okay, this is like episode two. Weird that they started in episode two and not one. I had no idea it was a follow-up. Um, but it is a crazy story. And let me just give you an idea of the artwork in here. This is Vep as she's going through training and the colors. And let me make sure I give credit where credit is due. Uh, Sloan Leong. And then the lettering is done by Lucas Gattoni. But Sloan Leong does everything. The art, 
and the writing in here. So this story begins on this planet named Eriatarka, which is this really strange, almost like a plant-based world where aliens live and everything can try to kill you. And then we have this interplanetary group of people that are known as the Chorus, and they're trying to colonize this planet. And part of this colonization is destroying a lot of this plants. So in order to do this, the Chorus train a bunch of soldiers on this planet to go out there and do this. And each one of them is given a crystal to kind of activate their powers. So that's where the term Prism Stalker comes from. And we meet the character of Vep, who is your main character, as she's going through training in here. And as you find out through here, she's, she's the one that signed up. She wasn't, like, drafted into this military camp. So here there's a lot of training, and it's really strange training. Um, it goes through training, like, your mind and your body. Visually, it is just amazing. I Like I said, I was lost because I was like, what, what exactly is happening? Like, they're just jumping into the story, and they've been here at war in their training, but... I hadn't read volume one and I was still able to figure it out. Like I said, I'm so happy that they added this part here to tell you who your trainees are and then who else is the teachers down here. And to just kind of give you the visuals, there's a scene in here where she is doing this exercise and she is being mentally attacked and she's being dragged down by her family. It's like a psychic realm. And it's all about just being attacked by unpleasant truths and being held by these hands of her family members. So what she ends up doing is ripping off her skin to get past that particular exercise. And that's the kind of character you're dealing with. And this is the type of artwork you're going to be seeing throughout these pages. Now, I think there was a couple of years in between volumes one and this one. Um, so I don't know if there's going to be more of the story, but the, it is so strange, bizarre, yet beautiful. In the back, you get some concept artwork, and I can't show all of it because some of it just uh, is a little bit of a spoiler. And then you have different artists' interpretation of the characters. This one has 160 pages and retails for $24.99. Blue Book. Now, this is one that I think comes out on September 19th. But it has been available on Substack. So it, it has been available. Um, this is one that's going to be hard to talk about because, like I said, I need to go through these quick because we got a couple more to, uh, to go through here. This is by James Tiny in the fourth and Michael Avon Oming, Aditya Bidikar doing the lettering. And this is phenomenal. This is my pick of the freaking batch of books. And let me tell you, there's Vault of Horror 3 in here. So it was difficult to pick just one. But if I had to pick one, this is it. This is a nonfiction retelling of famous or rather infamous abduction cases. So people that have had encounters of the third kind of the second kind first kind i can't even remember i uh, keep them straight anymore uh and it is just an amazing retelling of betty and barney hill and it all kicks off with this story in 1961 and the reason why it's called a blue book is because well actually let me let me tell you just the pitch and i promise um i'll make it quick so we meet these two characters of betty and her husband uh barney they're from New Hampshire, they went to Montreal, and they're trying to make it back to the States on a road trip. And they are both at a diner, and they're like, okay, if we keep driving on through the morning, we'll make it home by 2.30 in the morning. And she, Betty's like, eh, probably three with the way you drive. Now, like I said, they were on vacation, and this tells you a little bit about them right here. Uh, like Barney's illegal redress of the chairman of the Portsmouth chapter of the NAACP. And then it tells you a little bit about Betty and what she did for a living, then traveling with their dog. And what they see is something out in the sky. They see an unidentified flying object. And Barney doesn't believe in UFOs. Barney doesn't believe in supernatural things or sci-fi things. And this is 1961. And she's like, I'm serious. There's something out there. And he refuses to believe until finally he gets out and he starts looking at this thing up in the sky that seems to be following them. 
gets his binoculars out, and this is when it gets really creepy. And it brought back so many memories of going to the library and just reading about these particular stories. But when he takes his binoculars out, he's able to see shapes in those little tiny windows. And that freaks him out. And whether he imagined these beings or maybe that's what he really saw, doesn't matter. It freaked him out enough to run back to the car. Now, after he runs back to the car, this is where chapter two begins. There's a total of five chapters, and this is the last I'll talk about it, I promise. They go back... And they just start talking normal. Like, she's like, now do you believe in flying saucers? And he's like, don't be ridiculous. And they make it back home. But they make it back home at 5 o'clock in the morning. And at, earlier they were talking about being home at 2.30 in the morning or maybe by 3 o'clock, the way he drives. And they realize that there's some unaccounted time. There's some like unaccounted memories there. So this is beginning the whole mystery as to what happened so they start calling people uh they start calling you know newspapers and reporters uh they start calling uh people that work at nasa and just talk or air force really and talking about this ufo encounter and sure enough during that time at 2 14 that day in 1961 a radar picked up a craft four miles out of the base that briefly approached and then vanished and then they said well, maybe both of these cases are related or maybe not. And that is where the name Project Blue Book comes from. Hence the title. So the rest of the book is about them dealing with this and dealing with this story that they've shared with people. Some people don't believe them. They're trying to just live their lives. And then, of course, they decide to go through hypnosis. And you can find out what that means and what memories are awakened. Holy crap, this one was so good. Like... You don't even have to be a believer in UFOs to, to appreciate this. It is just beautifully drawn. Michael Avon Oming, who I'm going to talk about here in a little bit when talking about powers, has just gone completely bonkers with his colors here. So what he's using is using these two-tone blue colors to kind of set the mood. And I love that the it's called the Blue Book. Oh my gosh, this, this story could not have been done in color. I believe the tones that he used for this are just perfect in the back you get a little bit of the extras including some of the covers and variant covers like i mentioned this was originally published by substack some creepy imagery in here so if you want to be freaked out read this by yourself yeah these are the two tones that he's using here it's a great read now the book has 136 pages and retails for 24 dollars 99 and it's another one of those books that has sewn binding Next up is Minor Threats. This is a completely different tone. This was a lot of freaking fun. This is by Patton Oswalt and Jordan Bloom. Art by Scott Hepburn and Ian Herring doing the coloring while Nate Piekos of Blambot is doing the lettering. Now these two gentlemen, Patton Oswalt and Jordan Bloom are the showrunners, I believe, of, of the MODOK series, if I'm not mistaken. Now, the premise of this is a really interesting premise. We get to meet some D-list characters, and they're not just superheroes this time. They're supervillains. This is a group of D-list supervillains that just kind of never made it big. They're not your Lex Luthor type of supervillains. They're not your Sabretooth. They're just lesser-known villains in this city where superheroes reign, or in this particular world. And... Through here, we get to meet one particular character. This is the villain known as Playtime, or that's what she used to be known as. Uh, and she runs this, or she works at this bar where she just serves drinks. And this is Brain Tease, one of the villains. And then you get to meet the rest of the characters of these supervillains. But the story is about how this one D list supervillain named the Stickman has just gone crazy. And what Stickman did was murder Kid Dusk. And it's all over the news. And now they found out about it. And superheroes are going crazy. And why they're going crazy is because they're trying to find Stickman. Who, once again, was a D-list villain. And this Kid Dusk was the sidekick to kind of like the Batman of Twilight City. The Insomniac. So that's what his name is. So the Insomniac is just going crazy trying to find him. Going through a bunch of just D-list villains trying to find who killed 
Kid Dusk. So now Playtime decides... By the way, she has her own problems. Like, she's trying to see her daughter, and, you know, the, the father in the relationship just doesn't want her to be around her daughter because of all her troubles. She's a villain. And, you know, she doesn't feel like she's... Like, anytime she tries to redeem herself, something bad always happens. So what she decides to do, because all the superheroes are just out for blood, they're trying to... This is the part I was talking about, where she's trying to see her daughter, and nope, something bad happens because they're just trying to find out, the superheroes, where Stickman is, and nobody knows. So she's just tired of all this crap. What she decides to do is gather a team of D-list villains to go and find Stickman and kill him themselves before anybody else can get to him, before the Insomniac can get to him. And that's pretty much the pitch. I love the flashbacks that they're done with different color tones like we used to see in the 80s comics or even the Bronze Age, really. And even the papers yellowed. And then we go back to these clear and crisp colors. Uh, the artwork is phenomenal. Easy to follow, a lot of fun, and lots of violence. This is definitely mature content just because of the violence and the language. And do they succeed in their mission? Are they able to find Stickman? Well... You can find out for yourself. I don't know if there's going to be another volume or not. It says volume one, so I hope so. Because I don't want this world to end. It, it kind of reminds me of like a fun version of Black Hammer. And I love Black Hammer, but we need more lighthearted stuff out there. 136 pages in the book retails for $19.99. Powers, volume four. This is a thick trade paperback. This one is only $29.99, and it has 600 pages. This is Brian Michael Bendis and Michael Avon Oming. I just talked a little bit about in Blue Book. Uh, the colors by Pete Pantasis, and Ken Brusenak is the letterer. Now, this particular big 600-page book is broken up into three different story arcs. You have Legends... Let me see if it's actually, I think it does state, yeah, Legends Chapter 1. And Legends is pretty much in the aftermath of Volume 3. Superheroes have become illegal. They are not allowed in the city. And now Detectives Christian Walker and Dina Pilgrim are trying to investigate specific murders to superhero cases, even though superheroes have been declared illegal. And now... Of course, the criminals are taking note of this, and the crime wave is just all over the city. So, no superheroes are allowed. And, of course, um, if you've read the previous volumes, without going into spoilers about Dina and Christian, they have their own secrets that they don't know about. Like They're all keeping their own secrets from each other. Uh, good detectives, huh? Never talking things out. And that's practically what the second story arc is focusing on. The secret that they're keeping from each other. And that one is called Psychotic. And of course, more crimes that they have to investigate. The last story arc in here is called Cosmic. And this is when powers are just dropping out of the sky and leaving dead bodies throughout the city. And... One of the victims happens to be one of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Not the Marvel Guardians of the Galaxy, but a cosmic being in this particular world. And now, the story takes a cosmic turn. Going places you don't expect it to go. Crazy, crazy places. In the back, again, you get a whole bunch of sketches and artwork, character designs. Now, this book is is also mature content, not just because of the language and violence, but also the sexual content in here. And that is Powers, Volume 4. I think we have one more big collection coming out. Last, but certainly not least, The Vault of Horrors EC Archives, Volume 3. Now, this has been previously released in a hardcover format from Dark Horse Comics. I believe Volume 3 is when Dark Horse took over from Gemstone Publishing as the publisher, to kind of put the word out there of these wonderful EC collections and to, to make sure that they're, we're getting more of an audience than Gemstone could have done. There's an introduction here by Grant Gaisman talking about EC comics and, of course, the history behind it, how it started as education comics and then became entertainment comics. 
Uh, this forward right here talks a, a little bit about the history of the EC archives, the very book you see here. And of course, the modernization on the colors that some people have described as airbrushing. And I know it turns off some people that they would rather have things in black and white. I still think it's a wonderful collection if you've not read it. This is some of the stuff, like the very best stuff you're going to have in your library. Uh, there's a seance story right here with a twist that I wanted to talk about. I love this story. It's one of my favorites. Uh, when they're trying to fool somebody, then they're giving money. But then, of course, like every other Vault of Horror, of Haunted Fear, or Tales from the Crypt story, it turns on them when there's a real ghost that appears. But there's an even cooler story in here. By the way, this one has 216 pages. And these books are $19.99 compared to the hardcovers, which are 30 oh No, those were $49.99. And these are printed in magazine size. Now, there's a really cool story in here. Let me see if I can find it. And here it is. It is Let's Play Poison. And the reason I wanted to bring it up is because when I read it in the hardcover format a few years back, I found out that it was Ray Bradbury that wrote this story. I love Ray Bradbury. He had a show in the 80s called, the, what was it, the Ray Bradbury Theater. And then, of course, the 80s Twilight Zone were really based on so much of his work. Uh, the Velt is still one of my favorite short stories. But anyway, back to this. This is about a teacher just, just trying to escape to another little town uh, because he feels like, guilty for the death of this child uh, that was pushed out of his three-story window when he was teaching because he wasn't in class. Of course, he's not really trying to redeem himself. He's kind of a jerk about it as the years go on and then he gets his comeuppance. I just think this story is a classic example of what these tales from the crypt and uh, vault of horror and haunt of fear are about people just getting their come up and oh my gosh that i used to have this comic when i was i think i was in high school when i found it and it used to creep me out just that image right there um i don't think like these are not really mature themes i think th this is definitely stories for maybe teens plus because the kids were reading these books against their parents wishes and then we hope we have the whole seduction of the innocent because of that but there's just some really phenomenal stories here and it's not just the horror stuff right like there's frontline combat modern love shock and suspense i still need to find volume three of that but anyway this is the latest printing, it is a trade paperback, Vault of Horror, EC Archives. And if it wasn't for Blue Book and my fascination of just UFOs because I saw one as a kid, this would have definitely been my pick of this particular batch. But that, as they say, is that. If you're interested in purchasing any of these books, don't forget to check out our sponsors. If you're in Europe and you're interested in buying these books, definitely check out Walt's Comic Shop in Berlin, Germany. They have the cheapest pre-order prices, flat shipping rate of 12 euros for all EU countries, Emails answer within 24 hours, waltzcomicshop.com, and you can use the code near mint condition at checkout and get free shipping for all EU countries with your first order over 40 euros. That's Waltz Comic Shop, your reliable source for omnis and premium collected editions in Europe. Ding! Cheapgraphicnovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content and page count of each of these books. Let me know in the comments down below what series you are following, whether it's Powers or Air, or if you enjoyed the Prism Stalker and you didn't know that there was a follow-up to it, and what new series you have been checking out through Comixology, or you've been waiting for a physical release. If you have any questions, leave them down below. Don't forget to smash that like button on the way out. Everyone stay healthy and safe out there. Much love.